At noontime, we had an awesome service, and uh, it was just, the Lord just was awesome, but we, we're going to have an awesome, awesome service tonight. Thank you all for the four of you who are speaking. The theme is going to be the people who reacted to Jesus while he was on the cross. We're going to sing, and is our tradition here, while we start with the first hymn, uh, people will hold the cross, so just feel free. Uh, to get up and to replace somebody who's holding the cross. It's just one of those traditions. I kind of like it myself, but um, it's just one of those times where we're just all together uh, bearing our own cross along with that cross. Let's begin with prayer. Would you stand as we go into our first hymn? Lord Jesus, we come before you tonight to honor you, to come before you, to worship you, to... Um, magnify your name, to lay things at the cross, to learn something from anointed speakers. And we just ask Jesus that we come with the right heart and the right attitude tonight. We thank you. We praise you for dying on the cross for us. We just praise you, Lord. We thank you for our wonderful speakers and that you'd invite them. You give them special words as they've prepared and give them more than they've prepared. Thank you for feeding us through them tonight. Lord, we come not just only in a solemn attitude, but we come to, we know you rose from the dead and you dwell within us. But help us to enter into the crucifixion scene tonight. Help us to realize that we are crucified with you. Help us, Holy Spirit, to worship you. And as we take communion, that we are not just taking bread and juice, we are honoring you, remembering you, and your presence with us. So we thank you. And we thank you for all of the Good Friday services that are happening across this community to lift up the mighty, wonderful, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. amen.
Good evening. The people stood watching, and even the rulers sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. This is Luke chapter 23, verse 35 through 38. This never happens in Billings. You'll recognize this right away. A car speeds through a red light <laughs> and hits the car with the right of way. Never happens. But what happens after that? A crowd gathers. And you know why? because it's human nature to want to know what happened. And although very few would admit it, there's a universal sigh of relief that it wasn't me. <laughs> you know, we've all been there, done that. And this is possibly the thought of many who were in the crowd watching Jesus hang on the cross. Jesus' disciples, the women who followed him, his family and friends, they were dismayed and horrified. And the rest, a group of people from all walks of Jewish life, all stood and watched. A very disparate group. But what they had in common was they had seen far too many crucifixions. Because this was the Roman legion's favorite form of execution. You'd think they wouldn't even bat an eye any longer. But Jesus was notorious. He was notorious for his teaching and for his declaration of himself as God's son. And there were two additional groups of people that comprised those watching. There were the rulers. The rulers included the scribes and the elders, the chief priests, the centurion and the Sanhedrin. They were the religious elites of that day. And the soldiers, they were part of the Imperial Roman army. They were powerful and tyrannical, and they ruled through fear. Each group based their accusations of Jesus on a different premise. The religious rulers mocked Jesus' good works, he healed the people on Sunday, no less. He fed the poor and the hungry. They couldn't understand or accept the miracles he performed. He walked on water, and he turned the water into wine. Their hatred of him was so great that they were delighted, absolutely delighted to see Jesus on the cross. And you know what they thought? They thought, we won. We won, we won, we won. Look at where he is. We won. And then they challenged Jesus to save himself from the cross. They said, get down off that cross if you're the chosen one, the holy one of Israel. But what they failed to understand was he was saving them by being on that cross. They expected Jesus to save them from the Romans. And further, if he was anything but an imposter, he could save himself from the Romans, you know? If he was who he says he was, the Romans couldn't touch him. There was no way he was God's son. From the soldier's point of view, how could he be a king? He was a local carpenter. He was poor. He was a nobody. His claim to be king was an out and out lie and the ultimate insult to Caesar Augustus. Everyone knew Caesar was a god and the Romans were the final authority on everything and all bowed 
before almighty Caesar or suffer the consequences. This man was a common criminal, dying a common criminal's death. So together with scorn and sneering, they commanded Jesus, save yourself. Their contemptuous and arrogant reasoning, if you're the Christ, if you're God's chosen, if you're the elect, if you're the Messiah, if you're a king, save yourself. The religious elite ridiculed his messiahship, and the Romans ridiculed his alleged kingship. Scorn and mocking have their psychological roots in a need for control, in fear, in anger, and in entitlement. These were exemplified in spades by the religious elite and the soldiers. Each group acted as their station in life demanded that they do. But there's a bottom line here. They knew the truth. Knowledge of God has been written on man's heart since creation. In their innermost being, they knew he was who he said he was. Therefore, their loud scorn and derision, lest those watching, the group doing the watching, lest those watching know them for who they really are. The titulus or the proclamation that was nailed at the top of the cross tells the whole story. Jesus is the king of the Jews. As for those religious and the soldiers, their own hearts and then their words indict them.
My scripture this evening is about the soldiers, and it's in John 19, 23 and 24. If you want to uh, follow it, it says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam weaving from the top throughout that helps a little they said therefore among themselves let us not rend it but cast lots for it whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled which saith they parted my garment among them and from my vesture they did eat cast lots these things therefore the soldiers did now I'm going to look at this a little bit different this evening than normal, but it starts out, the scripture says, the soldiers, when they had crucified him. Here these soldiers are parting his garments. They said they parted the garment. They usually, the men wore like an undergarment of a robe, white robe, and they were parting his garments. These soldiers crucified Jesus. They had to have blood all over their hands and possibly all over their clothes when they did such a thing. And they went on to his, vet, his coat as well, but this was his robe. They divided it in four parts. The, uh, <clears throat> and then they took, let's see, Jesus' hands into his feet. They, Soldiers had just driven nails. They just got done crucifying him, just got done driving the spikes through his hands and through his feet, and then they end up kneeling over, having fun, departing his garments. Now, the other side of that is, what was Jesus experiencing? What was he thinking? What was he experiencing on that tree? The soldiers, we know what they were doing. If you turn to Psalm 22, verse 12 through 18, I'm going to read that to you, and you can see what David's prophecy was of Jesus hanging on that cross after they crucified him. And it says this, Many bulls have compassed me, Jesus is saying, strong bulls of Bashan, they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. Can you imagine? This is how Jesus felt on that cross. All my bones are out of joint. And he says, my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. We don't know what he went through. Horrible. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. He was completely dehydrated. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death, he says. For dogs has compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have indeed in, enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments, like Linda said in hers. The soldiers spit at him, ridiculed him, hanging on that tree. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. I wondered if those soldiers knew they were fulfilling prophecy. I doubt it. I doubt it very much. I like to relate this parting of garments to my own Christian fabric of faith. And these areas we're talking about, one is church. Do I participate and function in the church like I should? I think it's Romans 1, 6, it says, we need to gather ourselves together. 
And let's see, I've got that written down. And let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see that day approaching. And we can see that day approaching and living in the world that we're living in today. Seek me wholeheartedly, he says. Number two is my, how, how do I respond in my fabric of faith with my business, my job, another division of that garment of Jesus? Number two. And the three is, that I have is, my unbelieving friends, how do I respond with them? Am I ashamed to share the gospel or to share Christ with them? Where do I stand there? And then my family, how do I respond to my family? Am I moody, you know? Am I angry a lot of the time? That's the four fabrics of my faith I love to look at. Those are the four parts of that garment of my faith. And then we have the coat, the blood of Christ. All I can say about that is that he says, there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. And that's his coat. And he's done that for us. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you all for being here. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And thank you for the speakers that have spoken and for those that are still going to. Now, you notice Pastor Ross put me in the middle of the program because he knew if he put me at the beginning, some of you'd come late. And if he put me at the end, some of you would leave early. W one warning that I have to give you is that for me to give a, a talk or present a topic, I have trouble focusing on one idea. Uh, being in Montana, you've all, you've all observed a little bird out in the lawn or in the park pecking seeds, insects, and something disturbs him and he takes off in flight for a tree. Well, just then a 40 mile an hour gust comes blowing through and the bird has no, has no choice but to just go with that wind until he can alight somewhere and and, uh, well, I'm a little bit like that. I get that tree, that idea, focused, and then, whoo, a 40 mile an hour idea gust hits me, and it takes me off on another direction. Then I've got to reconnoiter and, and get back in focus. Well, the thieves who were crucified at the same time of Jesus. Now, let's read the short conversation between them uh, so we'll have that, we'll have that focus. Uh, Luke 23, 39. And tonight I'm using the uh, revised, new Revised Standard Edition. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same condemnation, the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, I love, I love a mystery. And I don't know how many books I've read, uh, particularly British authors, Agatha Christie, P.D. James, Nano Marsh, but some American authors too. But have you recently gone back and read the four gospel accounts 
of the, of the uh, events leading up to the crucifixion, the crucifixion and the events after it, it's fascinating. The plotting, scheming, behind the scenes maneuvering, the, the uh, characterizations. So put down your novel and reread those accounts. These narratives are not a novel. They are reality. They are history. And not just a Jewish story, but international. Find another narrative where the one who solves the crime, brings about justice, is the murder victim himself. And read all four, because they tell the same chain of events, but each has its own little twists and turns that makes it unique. Now, we can't really consider the two thieves without looking at crucifixion in general. Crucifixion was punishment administered by the Romans upon the Jews and slaves. Who were these two thieves? We are told so little about them. In fact, if you take your average Bible, depending on the translation, the type uh, face and the uh, and the supplementary material. Take the number of pages, multiply it by the uh, average words on a page. You come out with approximately 250,000. That's probably conservative. Only approximately 120 words are devoted to these two criminals. That comes out to a percentage of about 0 0.0005. So that's a pretty insignificant percentage. So these two, uh, these two thieves, these two obscure historical figures, they must be pretty insignificant too, right? No, I don't think so. I think they're very significant. I'm so glad that Luke recorded this conversation between them and between Jesus. A couple of things we can deduce about the thieves. Certainly they were Jewish, and they had been convicted, if you will, of crimes that were deemed by the Roman government to be quite serious. Probably, serious, probably crimes against Roman officials, administrators, or certainly someone serving the government. Whether they were crimes of violence, or perhaps they uh, robbed a, a supply caravan. We tend to think of these as these two as a pair, but we really don't know if they had been cohorts in crime or had been acted individually. Perhaps they had never met until they, with Jesus, were led off to be crucified. We also don't know if they had any prior knowledge of Jesus. Most likely they had heard about him. Perhaps they'd heard him speak, even seen him perform a miracle. But certainly, as they were being crucified, one on each side of him, they had observed and heard the vilification, the mockery, the taunting, the derisive accusations, they had seen the sign above his head. Thanks, Linda. This is the king of the Jews, written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Now, here's one of those idea gusts that's going to take us off course for a minute. This inscription by Pilate, he wrote, this is the king of the Jews. The Jewish leader said, no, no. Right, this, he says he's the king of the Jews. Pilate said, I have written what I have written. So what started out to be an inscription of mockery turned out to be a true proclamation above Jesus' head, king of the Jews. I want to talk a little bit about we think of, of the crucifixion of Jesus as taking place this week. But I think it began much sooner. 
read the second chapter of Matthew. When Jesus was born and the wise men came to Herod, they said, where's this child that was born king of the Jews? Well, he was frightened. He was so frightened that he sent and had all children under the age of two in and around Bethlehem killed. Now, he may have thought that he nipped that in the bud. He may have thought he'd killed Jesus. And then he died. And thank the Lord that, that God took Jesus out of, out of harm's way for that period of time. But then the quest was taken up again by the Jewish leaders once they learned of Christ's ministry. Now back to the thieves. Who were they? And why are they worthy of our consideration? Because it shows the, the fulfillment of prophecy of Isaiah 53, 12. Because he poured himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Or because it shows the grace and mer mercy of Jesus as he accepted the one thief's belief. Well, these are both important and they're good reasons. Yet I feel there is another really important factor. Now, crucifixion was a death sentence. The two men along with Jesus were on the threshold of death. And as was Jesus, they were experiencing physical and emotional agony. And hearing and observing the abuse of Jesus, they were led to ponder individually, is this just another man like us? Or is he the Messiah? At first, they joined in the taunting. But as time went on, the one reconsidered and defended Jesus to the other. These men were faced with a simple choice, belief or unbelief in Jesus. Accept him or mock him. One chose to believe, the other apparently not. Now I wanna refer to four Bible passages that I feel tie, ties this all together. John 15, 13, Jesus had said, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. When this, this criminal, this bandit, this thief, when he accepted Jesus, As the son of God, he became Jesus' friend. And Jesus was laying down his life for him, not only him, but he was included. John 10, 18, Jesus had said, and the pastor Ross referred to this in his sermon this past Sunday, Jesus had said, no one takes my life from me but I lay it down of my own accord. And in Luke 15, 7, again quoting Jesus, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And fourth, Hebrews 12.2, we are told, looking to Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now, I've always interpreted that, the joy in that verse, to be Jesus' joy. Yeah. It, how could I attribute a selfish motive to Jesus, right? But unknowingly, un unthinkingly, that's what I was doing. When that sinner repented on the cross, I think there was joy in heaven, and there was, there was, and for Jesus, even in his agony, and for that thief, think of the joy 
in the heart of that thief at that moment and in the hours to come. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And you and I can share and experience that joy. The joy set, be set before him, before Jesus, was for everyone, all of mankind. So once again, who are these two thieves, these sinners who were crucified, who were crucified alongside Jesus? Please don't be offended at what I'm going to say. But I propose to you that those two thieves were you and me. And all, all of us who are faced at some point the choice of belief or unbelief, acceptance or mockery. Praise the Lord that most of us don't have to make that choice on the threshold of death. And yet, are we not all on that threshold at any time? These two thieves were a representation of each one of us, a microcosm of all mankind. So like the one thief, choose Jesus. Say to him, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. And he'll reply, soon you'll be with me in paradise. Choose Jesus and reaffirm that choice daily. Join me in just a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you loved your creation, your creations, so much that you were willing to have your son crucified for us. And Jesus, thank you for enduring the suffering, the agony of crucifixion. And thank you for putting those two thieves there to show us the choice and the right way to, the right way to go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I can get you two guys just to stay there for a moment. What a good word. What good words. I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in God ordaining steps and putting things together. It's amazing that Psalm 22 was read twice today from this platform, both at noontime and Chad read Psalm 22. The pastor who used that used different verses, but I think that's a God thing. It's just awesome. Wow, great words. <clears throat> and we'll have more. On your bulletin, you have a slip of paper. Now, this has been a, a tradition. Those of you who are brand new with us, uh, what we're going to do is uh, <clears throat> I'll Write whatever you want on this piece of paper, and you'll come up. You're invited to do this. You don't have to do it. I think it's a unique um, spiritual and one of those exercises that kind of forces you to do something. We've got extra pieces of paper over here, too. What do you write on this piece of paper? That's really between you and the Lord. Maybe you write something about sin that you struggle with, that you want victory over. Amen. Maybe it's a prayer. Maybe it's a, a, a release of a burden, an issue of surrender. Uh, maybe it's a loved one. Maybe it's a person who needs healing. Um, and then I, I wrestle with it, but I've done it so often that I don't wrestle with it anymore. But even tonight, I'm going, well, why nail it? Because it's a symbolic action. It's almost a prophetic action that I am putting this in your hands. As I am crucified with Christ on the cross, so are my concerns. And it's that prophetic action that kind of does something to me. And I prayed earlier today that as we do this, that people will walk out of the building tonight feeling like whatever it was you put on the paper is gone. 
It truly is in his hands. It's out of your backpack. Whatever you want to put on this piece of paper, if you want more, there's more paper. Um, but we just call it nailing our burdens to the cross. Again, you're invited. You don't have to. But I want to challenge you to make this a step of faith in your life right now. We did this at the Lenten retreat Sunday afternoon. So for me, doing it again doesn't take away its freshness. It, it, I, I have other things that perhaps I'm going to put on this piece of paper. So if you two would just stay there, and then you'll have an opportunity. I'll switch places with your son. So you have an opportunity. All right, Father, as we do this exercise, we just want to be real with you. Lead every one of us in what to write. It may be something that, oh, I think I'll write this, and all of a sudden we find ourselves writing something different. Maybe something very simple. It may be an expression of saying, Lord, I love you. Whatever it is, I thank you, Jesus, that you, you not only see our thoughts, <laughs> you see what we write. And it's out of your love that we come to express our love in this way. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen.
Reflection tonight is on the women at the crucifixion. The verses are John 19, 25, and Mark 15, 40 to 41. Hmm? Is that a little better? Okay. Okay. The women at the crucifixion were faithful followers of Jesus who witnessed his agony and death. A crowd of them stood at a small distance from the cross, yet not so far 
watching and weeping while he suffered and the soldiers mocked and gambled for his clothing. The women didn't abandon him, even when some of the disciples had fled in fear. They were the first to see the empty tomb and the risen Lord. These were the women who loved Jesus to the end and beyond. There were several women who witnessed the death of Jesus at the cross. Their names and relationships are, they vary depending on the gospel account, but we have Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. She, we know, accompanied Jesus from Galilee, as many of them did, and supported him financially. We have Mary of Clopas, Salome, the mother of James and John, two of Jesus' closest disciples. She also followed Jesus from Galilee and served him with her possessions. We have Joanna, who was healed by Jesus and also the wife of a man who worked for King Herod. And we have Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Mark, he says that many other women were there. Many other women were there who had come with Jesus from Galilee. The Apostle John writes that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and three of these women were close enough to the cross to hear Jesus' final words. The King James Version says, they stood by the cross. These women loved Jesus and stayed with him. They had the strength to endure the suffering and heartbreak of the broken and bloody Jesus on the cross. They showed courage, devotion, loyalty, faith, and love in a time of danger, uncertainty, and sorrow. Not fully understanding what was to be fulfilled at the tomb, their grief must have been overwhelming. And yet they stayed by the cross and the tomb, even when it seemed all might be lost. And don't think that the women weren't at risk for their beliefs either, because um, followers of Jesus were not immune to arrest, imprisonment, torture, and death, whether they were men or women. So these many brave women stayed near the cross and beyond. They'd given up everything to follow Jesus, and they held fast to their faith in the most gut-wrenching hours. They held fast to Jesus in the most gut-wrenching hours. And also, without these courageous women, we might have lost some details of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection resurrection because, as it turns out, they were the ones who were there. So how do we, men and women, stand by the cross? I ask myself, how do I stay near the cross? Can I get closer? Can we get closer? Can we get close enough to Jesus to hear him? Or do we run the other way? Will we hold fast if all seems lost? Do we have courage in our beliefs? I'm not very brave, I wonder what I would have done. Does our discipleship come at a cost? What's our risk following the risen Jesus when these women had such, it's so, it's small compared to these women who followed him in faith to his death at the cross. So, a little prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for your love and forgiveness. I want to be close to you, Lord. I want to follow you and obey you. Please help me keep my eyes on you every day. Please help me to remember your sacrifice and your grace. Please help me to share your tr love and truth with others. In the name of our Father, amen. many of you are ready for a new experience in Jesus? Come on, everybody should be raising their hands. Okay. Tonight we're going to have a new experience. And I want to share this with you because it works for me at home. And 
I pray that after this, you can do this at home. My scripture is not as it's listed as John 15, 39. It is in Mark. Okay. So right now, I want everybody to close your eyes. I just want you to relax where you're seated. Maybe if you want to, make a little space between you and the one next to you. What I want you to do is to relax. Feel comfortable. I don't want nobody moving around or heading out the back doors. So for now, close your eyes. This is an exercise in meditation of Jesus, upon Jesus at the crucifixion. in a deep breath and hold it. Slowly let it out. Keep your eyes closed. Take in another deep breath and hold it. Again, slowly let it out. I want you to look at your mind. Picture it as a theater. Something you can look at. Start to see the picture before you like before you like you're in your mind. Picture this. It's about 9 a.m. in the morning. You see around you the city of Jerusalem. There's a crowd of people there. see the streets full of buildings. You see a dirt road before you with drag marks in it and what looks like drops of blood. You begin walking the path, stepping around small rocks like this path. As you walk the path, it starts leading you up to the mountain. You continue to walk up that path. As you look up on the hill that you know is called Golgotha, you see a crowd of people. You see they are standing around three crosses with figures of men you're now at the top of the mountain. Can you see it? Can you picture it? You get closer and you hear people yelling, screaming, crying in agony. You begin to see figures on the crosses of people who are in agony and dying. sadness grows. You can see there are two robbers on the outer crosses. And this teacher, the blasphemer, the one who has caused problems so much is on the cross in the middle. You can hear him saying words, not quite understanding them. Soldiers are gathered around the crosses. You hear screams from women close up to this man called Jesus and sobs coming from some of his followers that are with these women. You begin to look up at this man on the cross in the middle Blood is running down his body and dripping to the ground. You begin to feel sorrow entering you. You hear the soldiers yelling at this man. They are crucifying him on the cross. Many 
things that begin to go through your mind as you take in the scene. Can you see the temple leaders from the temple hollering insults at this man too? They're saying, save yourself, come down from that cross. Others say, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see you and believe. You hear that? Can you hear it? Can you see it? You begin to feel cold as the sun is blocked by the clouds. Can you feel the sadness of this man dying? Do you feel it overcoming in your body? Time is passing. man who called himself king of the Jews. You hear him cry out. With a loud voice you hear this man then call Jesus cry out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You begin to feel tears in your eyes hearing this. Your heart's changing. The soldiers are beginning to shout again. see the women sobbing and crying out to this man Jesus. You feel yourself fall into your knees as you begin to cry for this man and you don't know why. You feel the tears falling down your great face. Your heart hurts as Jesus out a loud cry of agony. He cries out, it is finished. You know that painful death is now completed. His head falls into his chest. You see the soldiers pierce his side. Tears are falling fast, and you know that this man has died. You're crying inside. Then you realize your cries are coming outside of you as you are screaming in agony, too. The wind becomes roaring about you. see people falling down with the look of astonishment on their faces as the ground starts to shake. And then you hear this voice of authority. It is a centurion, the leader of the Roman soldiers, who is saying it. He's looking up at Jesus on that cross. He's dead. says, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now you know. Now you realize the situation. The centurion was a leader from Rome and didn't believe such nonsense, but he said it. He said this man was the Son of God. He isn't even a Jew. And he is saying this man, Jesus, is the Christ. He is the Christ, the Son of God. You begin saying it in your mind. 
This man is really the Son of God. Wow. You now know why you are hurting and crying. You heard him speak and teach, but you didn't believe. You know that he healed people. You know that he forgave others their sin. You know that he can forgive your sins too. saying to you, to your heart in this moment here right now is this man that has died on the cross in your life right now? It says in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. In Romans says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As you hear this, know like the centurion that you can say this man, Jesus the Christ, is truly the Son of God. You can say this prayer here with me if you want. Father God, I know I am a sinner and I have sinned against you. I believe that your Son, Jesus Christ, died on that cross for all of my sins. That blood that flowed from Jesus' body washes away my sin makes me a new creation in his sight. Lord, I repent of my sins and I will turn my life around to honor and respect you. I am yours now and forever will be at your side. Thank you, Lord, for giving what you did, your life. step up front here to the symbol of the cross that Jesus, Christ Jesus died upon. If you prayed that prayer and you mean it. Someone will meet with you and pray with you. Feel the strength of the centurion as he said those words. Truly, this man was the son of God. So stand up right now if you've said that prayer and meant it. Come forward don't have any fear. Is there anyone?
Thought of me above. 